Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. This is that. Now you've all heard that saying and you recognize it from Acts chapter 2. And you may turn there if you like and you're in the Word of God. It has to do with Pentecost Day. When they were speaking in that tongue, and you're all familiar with it, I'll just fill in just a little bit because that is not necessarily the subject. But as you will read in verses 6 and 7, every individual heard that tongue that's to say the tongue of Pentecost Day, in his own language, even in the dialect of the county within which he were, was born. Meaning that was the evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And they continued on and people, they were amazed. And I imagine that with the presence of the Holy Spirit in hearing this, they knew all these people were Nazarites that were speaking basically, that God had touched. And they commented, how are they talking in our tongue when they, when they come from, um, um, uh, the, uh, from among the Nazarites? So anyway, it would just be like someone in, in um, Minnesota hearing me talk in their specific tongue, you know, dialect. Uh, or better yet, a citizen of Tokyo hearing. So... But that wasn't the major deal. That was the evidence of the Holy Spirit being present. And that's the way you can tell when you hear it in the tongue of the county that you were born, whatever your nationality, race, whatever. Now, Peter then begins to correct. And that's where we're going to pick up at because it's more important what they were saying, what they were talking about, than the fact that they could talk. So we're going to take a very close look at what it was they said because it is written and it's important and it's a day yet even future. So uh, with that thought, pick it up with me if you will. In verse 16, following those things that I'd stated and Peter is saying, but this, there's nothing wrong with these people, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It doesn't take a real bright person to understand then, well, you would go back to the minor prophets and Joel would probably tell us what they were saying. At least he talked about it. 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days. And that's the day I want you to think about because we're going to understand what they did say hinging on that day. Saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, not just half of it, not just the male population, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And of course, this would be naturally with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And he continues on about the signs and the wonders, but skip to verse 21. And it shall come to pass, not maybe, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that's kind of a key I want you to hang on to. From this is that. In other words, what it is, is after the false, the spurious Messiah appears on earth, Many are going to be deceived. But there is a remnant. Uh, this is what Joel was talking about. And you may begin turning there if you like to the book of Joel and the Minor Prophets. This is what he was talking about. He first, and we're not going to go f certainly through the entire book of Joel. But um, this is what he was talking about. Just following the book of Hosea, was the locust army spoken of in Revelation chapter 9. We know when they're going to appear, it's going to be the last day. 
We know who their chief is, Apollyon and Ababdon, given both in the Greek and the Hebrew, so that you wouldn't miss who we're talking about, the destroyer. Who wants to destroy your soul? Satan does, of course. There's only one son of perdition, for he's the only one already sentenced to perish. So let that, you know, you'd be pretty far behind if you didn't know who he was. So, it tells of he, he leading his army, and they're not actually locust. They're his people, and those that will follow him as he sets himself up as Jesus Christ, only he's a fake, coming out the gate. And Joel continues with this, but I want to skip down, if I, and, and incidentally, it's written there, we, we have the advantage of that army of Satan's. Why? God is with us. God leads us. But it's important, again, that we know what was said that day. Because it's important to you, especially if you are part of that remnant that God intends to use. So we go to the second chapter of Joel. And I want to skip, if I may, all the way down to verse 28. We're going to pick it up about the same place where Peter started quoting it in the book of Acts so that you have an overlap of both the Old and the New Testament. And it shall come to pass afterward. There's that saying again, that statement. After what? After the locust army, after Satan appears on earth, that I will pour out my spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. And he continues, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Many of you have observed some of these very divine things, I feel, that have transpired in this generation, the generation of the fig tree. That is to say, after Israel become a nation in 48, both the good and the bad figs were sown there. And uh, which we are not to judge one way or the other, but to follow God's word. 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood and before the great day and great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Second advent. Now, we know that the moon has been turned to red in last year's Passover in total eclipse. The actual moon that determines the high day of Christianity, Passover. And the very high day in which the moon declares the Feast of Tabernacles, blood red. So you need to get your head out of the sand and observe some of the, the signs that God is bringing to pass. That was exactly six months later. And exactly six months after that on Purim this year, it's going to go red again. And if that's not good for, enough for you, six months later, it's going to go red again giving us about three groups of six periods of sixes there. You know, God has a way of ringing our bell occasionally and saying, Hello, are you there? So we see many of these things as they come to pass. Verse 32, and this is, where we're, this is why I wanted to bring you here. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant, underline that in your mind, in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now many of you have known there was more to God's word than you'd been taught since you were a small child. God does call that remnant. He has a way of kind of getting their attention of creating a hunger for the Word of God. You see, there's a great deal more to this because within that one verse, we have locked in the events that transpire at that time and if you would, even some of the words because God loves all His children and as it is written in 2 Peter chapter 3, 
It is God's will that all come to repentance. He is long-suffering. That means He's very patient. And He's got time for His teachers to teach His Word. Not theirs. Not the Word of some church system. But the Word of God. So, within this, we draw clues. And I want it, Isaiah spoke of it. If you would, let's go to the 11th chapter of Isaiah. What was spoken that day? That day that he stated would come. That whosoever, under the seed planting and the teaching of those that God would call, which is to say, his election. You're all familiar with this 11th chapter. It has to do with, even if you would, the eternity. Okay, let's pick it up in the 11th verse. And here is your key. And it shall come to pass in that day. That's the day we're talking about. This is that that Joel the prophet spoke of. In his hand again, the second time, meaning second advent. To recover the remnant of his people. What remnant? The remnant that are not deceived by Antichrist. The remnant that is not deceived by the spurious Messiah. Which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Patmoth and from Cush and from Elam and from Sinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. Do you know what is given there? I can simplify it for you real easy. It's northeast, south, and west. That's the direction geographically that these locations were from the writer. Meaning from everywhere. Wherever they're scattered. Verse 12. And he shall set up an ensign uh, for the nations and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. It's going to happen when? The second time, his second advent. You can count on it. Where where are you going to be? Ask yourself that. Where will I be? Will I have been deceived? It is ironic the way God uses the word Assyria. For in the 14th chapter of this same book of Isaiah, Lucifer himself is called the type of the Assyrian, king of Babylon for you that would look deeper and that would understand. Verse 13, The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex uh, Ephraim. There's been a little bit of, you know, the houses split. You've got the house of Judah and you've got the house of Israel. They're still split. But they will, as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 37, be joined back into one stick at the time we're speaking of. It's talking about the same thing. The verse we just covered ties directly to that 30, the closing verses of Ezekiel chapter 37 concerning the dry bones. That is to say, waking up God's people and putting spiritual life into their spiritually dead bodies. Biblically illiterate uh, they are. Not understanding our Father's word or the events that are transpiring around them. Verse 14. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines. Philistines in the Hebrew tongue means the migratory ones. Toward the west they shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom And Moab and the children of Ammon shall obey them. At that second advent, every knee, every knee is going to bow to him. But do you not remember also in the minor prophets we we, we just left there, not in the book of Joel, but in another book where God said, I'm going to sift. And everyone, even those from Edom and Ammon, that are good grains, I will save. Whosoever will. 
not be deceived. When the false one appears, God's going to call them out. And they're going to speak. They're going to plant that seed. They're going to speak with that tongue. Are they going to? No. The Holy Spirit will speak through them. It is the doings of our Father, for He is our Commander-in-Chief. He is our leader. And it is He that speaks at that time. Therefore, you can rest assured that what is said will be perfect. For it will not be we, but He that speak. You'll find that recorded, as you all know, in Mark 13. Probably your destiny. So you all should know that chapter 13 of the book of Mark. Those that are delivered up and the Holy Spirit speaks through them. Um, every knee bowing, 15. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river. That's Euphrates. What is Euphrates? So that you synchronize your mind. It's always been the border between Israel and Babylon. Meaning confusion will be erased. That's what Babel is, is confusion. And shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shod. That should call something back to memory, shouldn't it? Remember Pharaoh and his captivity? 16. And there shall be a highway for the remnant. For who? For the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, from the Assyrian, the Antichrist, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Many of you might have said, boy, I would like to have seen that opening of the Red Sea. You're going to see something better. It's going to happen in and to this generation. Men have preached the end of time, or are you? No, I'm not. I just know the generation. I don't know the day, the year, the time. But I do know that it would all things would come to pass as it's written in that same 13th chapter of Mark in the generation of the fig tree. That is to say, after 2,000 years almost, Israel goes back home. And along with both the good and the bad figs, as it's written in Jeremiah 24. That's only happened one time. So there need be no confusion in your mind. So he is calling a remnant. And that remnant studies his word and knows his plan. Knows of that day. So that they're not caught short. So that they're not sleeping. My, my. what You know, even the prophets wanted to live in this generation. And here you are. You want to be a champion of your people? Then follow him. It's that simple. It's to be with the right father. Don't be deceived by the spurious Messiah that will appear soon working miracles in the sight of many people, and they believing that it is the Christ. Why? Because they're unlearned. Don't fall off into that. Stay true, and let that Spirit speak through you, that that truth may go out to save whosoever will, or whomsoever will, if you prefer. Isaiah wasn't the only one that taught this along concerning that same day. Jeremiah did it also. If we will, let's turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31. Jeremiah, chapter 31. And we pick it up in verse 7. For thus saith the Lord, sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel, those that remain true, those that stick with the truth. Did he say cry? No, he said sing. That's, that's a form of 
rejoicing, if you would. Verse 8. Behold, I will bring them from the north country. Which way did the ten tribes go? They went north. They went over the Caucasus Mountains. They later settled Europe, many later migrating to this great nation. And you know something? They don't even know who they are today. Many people can't count their generation back past one or two, three, maybe at the most, to know what the Word of God means to them. But it does mean salvation to everybody, whosoever will. But some of you have a destiny. You're supposed to pay attention whereby our Father can use you. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, her that travaileth with child together, a great company shall return thither. This has to do with the labor pains or the birth pains of a new age. You want to be a part of it? Not the new age movement you hear about in the world, but of your father. We're talking about the millennium. Verse 9, they shall come with weeping and with supplication will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters, that's the waters of life, Christ is that, in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Ephraim is always referred to as the ten tribes because he was the larger of the tribes. Do you want to know how you find the truth? Listen, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doeth his flock. That's why he sent the shepherd, Jesus Christ. That opens it up to whomsoever will. But there is still that remnant. Are you part of it? 11. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, that's the natural seed, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Uh, Satan naturally was stronger. But he ransomed all of us with what? With his blood on the cross. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd and their soul shall be as a watered garden. That means they're going to have peace of mind. They're going to know what's happening and they shall not sorrow anymore at all. Has that happened yet? Of course not. We see sorrow all over the world. Bad things happen. But it's going to change. 13. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. For I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. What is this virgin? Have you ever heard of the ten virgins? Five of them fell. Five of them slipped. Five of them fell. Because what? They didn't have enough oil, that is to say the truth, to get them through the twelfth hour. See that you have that knowledge of God's plan. It's very simple. All you have to do is study God's word, His plan, and ask Him for understanding. There is not a person in the world that can understand all of God's Word at one reading. It's as the Holy Spirit will when you ask for knowledge and guidance. Don't make some religious ritual out of prayer. Talk to Him. He knows you. You're His child. And He loves you. When you have a problem, talk to Him just like you would your earthly father. Only you can even be more open with Him because He already knows your mind and what you're thinking. And he certainly loves you. Verse 14, I will satiate, that's to say saturate, the soul of the priest with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. I don't know, are you? 
then if you're not satisfied with truth and with understanding of what's happening in this world, I would say one thing. Dig just a little deeper. Ask for just a little more help. I promise you, He will not let you down. He will never leave thee, nor will He forsake thee. Fifteen. We're going to have a little history that is an analogy here. Listen to it carefully. Thus said the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. This is Rachel. You know, she died at the birth of Benjamin. She called him son of my sorrow. The father changed his name from Benai to Benjamin, which is son of my right hand. And that is the seed through which Christ, that is to say the tribes, the seed through which Christ would come. Thus saith the Lord, refrain, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. I'm going to gather them again at the second advent. It's going to happen, 17. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. He's going to gather them. On that day, when this voice is spoken, that is to say, the voice of Pentecost Day, when some of you are called are a, and have a destiny in helping bring forth that word, both planting seeds, and then in the ultimate, in the gathering, following God as He leads you, even when you stand against the false one. What a time to live. You think the parting of the Red Sea was something? Stick around. Stick around. It's going to be great. Am I saying the ocean's going to be parted? No, it's a spiritual thing. Of the weight and the almighty hand of God as He brings His full plan, consummates it before our very eyes. You got a part in it? I think so. I really do, or I don't think you would be here. I don't think it's any accident that you're here. God calls whom He will to serve Him. Let Him know you love Him for that. Well, what can we do now? We've have read uh, Jeremiah, great prophet, Isaiah, great prophet, talking about that day, that day in which that word was spoken. Let's go back to the minor prophets for a moment. Let's go back to Micah in the minor prophets. Just a little bit past Joel where we started there. Joel, a little bit of Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and then Micah. Let's go to Micah, the fourth chapter. It's not going to be a long lecture today. Just enjoy the Word of God. Let's pick it up in verse 7 so that we get a little different flavor of that day. Verse 7, Micah, chapter 4. And I will make her that halteth a remnant. Those that a lot of people would call lame, and I'm going to tell you something, a lot of them will call you lame-brained for not following the way they follow. But always follow the Word of God, never follow a man. Follow God and His Word. And her that was cast off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. Do you think that's happened yet? No, it hasn't. But it's going to on that day that we're speaking of. It's going to happen. That remnant that does not lose their, I speak spiritually, virginity to the spurious Messiah, that is to remain a bride for Christ, the true Christ, will take part. Eight, O thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion. Unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom, shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. And this has to do with the Tower of Ophel, with the Key of David, another subject for another time. The, the remnant, think of it. Nine. Now why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? 
Is thy counselor perished? What's a counselor? It's where you get your advice. Yes, they crucified him. No, they didn't. They only thought they brought his death. Though they did crucify him, he lives. These were the words of Christ to uh, Mary of Magdalena. when he, Woman, why weepest thou? He had just paid the price that gives us salvation for believing. He did not perish. Our counselor is still with us both in spirit and through this word. For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail, meaning it's the birth of a new age. Do you got a part in it? God ever speak to you and say, there's more to this than people are telling you? Then study it for yourself. Dig into it. Verse 10. Be it pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail, for now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. You're, you're going to go through Babylon. You might as well know that. That means the spurious Messiah here, the king of Babylon of the great book of Revelation. But hey, he's no problem to us. We have power through Christ over him. Thou sh there shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. You don't have a thing to worry about when you understand the plan of God. Boy, what a time to serve him. A time of action. Giving God's word a meaning in your heart. When you learn, I've got a part in it. It is written to me. It's the instructions that God sent to me to know what it is that I'm to do for Him. And then God pours all His blessings out upon you when maybe before your life was just knocks and bumps and seemed like nothing ever quite worked out right. You serve Him. And the bumps won't be any problem at all. 11. Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, let her be defiled. And let our eye look upon Zion. If you think for one moment when you stand against the false Messiah that you're going to be popular with a lot of people, you're mistaken. Because they're going to think he's Christ. And you can imagine what they will think of you when you say, no, he isn't. He's not the true Messiah, the one that died for us on the cross and yet lives. But God will always protect you and your rewards in the eternity are fantastic. Twelve. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel. You see, we have a counselor and we have a king, and that king is Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. For he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Again, that is the gathering of whosoever will. But there are some that have an opportunity to serve him even before that time. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thee, I will make thine horn iron. Horn is symbol of power. I will make you a powerful person, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord. And their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Thresh. What is thresh? What is it talking about? You separate the wheat from the shaft. You want to be part of a threshing crew? It isn't the painful thing in which it way it comes forth, but to plant the truth and give people hope, to give them something to live for, rather than from one paycheck to the next, barely getting by, but to have a purpose and a destiny, and to know that the creator of all things is in your life, and that you are his servant, willing to serve him as he has spoken, as he has written, sending this set of instructions, telling us how to operate these little old things and be successful. Or... On the other hand, we can listen to man and end up in the ditch, probably. 
I would prefer to have peace of mind and be pleasing to God, win, lose, or draw. Whatever trouble comes up. You know, trouble, when you are in the Father's plan, trouble's not a problem to you. It's just a little challenge. Just a little challenge. Something to take care of. It's, it, it's an exercise. It keeps you sharp. So let God come into your life. Now, we started in the New Testament. I'm going to finish in the New Testament. We're going to go to the book of Romans. We're going to go to Paul to conclude. Book of Romans chapter 9. 10 rather. Chapter 10. We're going to pick it up with verse 13. You see, it doesn't matter whether you're in the Old or the New Testament. When you're talking about that day, it's all the same. For God is the same yesterday, He is today, and He will be forever. That's one of the good things about serving Him. He doesn't change His mind. He's not wishy-washy. He gives you stability in your life. Verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It comes from Joel chapter 2 verse 32. That, that that was spoken on that day for your documentation. 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How could they? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? If they haven't heard of him, if they haven't heard the false Christ is coming first, how are they going to stay away from him? This is important, beloved. And how shall they hear without a preacher? A preacher means a teacher. Has God called you to plant seeds, maybe to help someone that is down? Someone that maybe doesn't know where the dead are, that you could help them understand life? That you could comfort them? That God could use you as a tool? How are they going to know? It's real easy for us to say, look at those poor people that never crack open the Word of God to learn what's happening in this world. Well, whose fault is it? Well, we could take a lot of the blame but I thank God for this congregation that none of the blame falls on you because we reach more people with God's blessings because we work together as a family and we get that word out there. Had we gone back to the beginning of chapter 2 in that great book of Joel, it would have said, Sound that trumpet and give the warning. Well, that old trumpet is Big Mama, right down there at the bottom of the hill. She's 33 foot across. That's why we call her Big Mama. And she gets the job done. I'll tell you. Push one button, you go around the world. Just instantly almost. Nanoseconds, so what? But you are active within that. But God wants the people to know that's why he calls people. That's why he touches hearts. Because you see, he knows you. He knows whether he can count on you. He knows whether if some little thing goes wrong, you're going to fall apart at the seams. He knows you got what it takes. You're can-do type people. Because you trust him. And you believe. Stuff goes wrong at work. So what? You're a child of God. Feel sorry for the person that isn't and work it out. I don't mean for you to be a, a, a foot wipe place, what do you call it, a doormat for, doormat, that's it. I don't want you to be a doormat for anybody, but you're wise enough you don't have to be, all right? Help them. Verse 15, and how shall they preach except they be sent? Unless God sends you, I don't care how good a preacher you are, you're not going to accomplish anything. What is a sent one? That's what the word apostle means. When you say apostle, that's all you're saying is sent one. You know, the other day when you witnessed to that person, and you thought, well, how come me to do that? They asked, and I just kind of went on there, just don't go overboard. 
Do you think God didn't know about that? Do you think you've got some little corner over here in your life that he's not aware of? He knew. He sent you. Possibly. Think about it. He uses his children. And it's not all going to wait right until the last day. And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And of course, we have that in Isaiah. That's from Isaiah again, 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah, which is Greek for Isaiah in the Hebrew, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Not the word of men. Not, you, never follow Arnold Murray. Follow the word of God. And don't you ever try to make yourself some uh, little God in the world. Because you're a servant of the living God. Let him send you. Well, how can I know if you're successful? If you're successful, God sent you. And that, that won't hold up in every case because sometimes you're planting a seed that God didn't intend that person to hear it until you're delivered up to witness. And then that person says, Aha! They told me this was going to happen. And now it is. I believe. And I think that is the group that falls into the 144. For they did not remain virgins, as it is written in Ezekiel 44, but went astray when Israel did for a short period, but come out. So those things are God's business, not ours. So what was spoken on that day? The truth of what's going to happen in this day, in this generation. The truth about that locust army. If you need a little refreshing on that, go back and start reading the four seasons of the locust in chapter 1. And then when they come to maturity in chapter 2, you're to give the warning when that army comes and you don't have to worry about them because God is causing it to come to pass to test the people. But you're still to remain strong and stand against it. And we already have the victory. That's that day. That's when that word goes forth. Whereby, what does it accomplish? Whosoever. Don't feel sorry for them if they've never heard the truth. That is, to, I, 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 let me rephrase that. Don't blame them. But give them the truth if God sends you. Think about it. Pray about it. Don't become some religious fanatic that goes down on the sidewalk and says, Hey, stop, stop. I've got some blaring news you've got to hear. What are they going to think? Here is a nut. This person has lost their, go their they got their gourd all stirred up, you know. You always protect your credentials, your credibility. But you know when God sends you. That's what he's talking about. When I send you, you're going to know it in your heart and in your mind. And it's going to pour forth like honey over the buds of their mind. And they're going to know it's truth. And I heard it not from man, but from God's word. Think about it. God is dealing with the people today. And you are that people. Think about it. Father, we thank you for the privilege of serving you, for it is a privilege indeed. Be with everyone this day in that service through the hard and through the easy, Father. We give you the thanks and the blessings and the praise. In Yeshua Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? 
Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Okay, any questions or comment um, from on that subject or any other subject. And if I don't know the answer, I'll make something up quick. I'm, I jest. <laughs> yes, you were first. In Isaiah 19, it gives the, uh, in the latter part of the chapter, it mentions that Yahweh is going to build a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And I think it's in the same time frame of the subject matter that you were it still applies. If you went to Zechariah 14, you'd know what that highway was. Think about your time sequence and think for a moment about Zechariah 14. That's where Christ's feet touches on the Mount of Olives and what happens. He prepares a way right to the east gate, right to where Satan's sitting as the spurious Messiah, as it's written in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse uh, 5 and 6. You bet, it's part of it. And, and there was somebody else, right? Yes. Welcome from Minnesota. How would, did you, it's cold up in Minneapolis, isn't it? Well, great. It's, I'm glad you all are getting thawed out. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Repeat it. He, asked, he said, in Minneapolis, like there's groups that gather, that study with the chapel, that have their own little Bible lessons around. And he said, sometimes they come up with something. They'll take one thing and overplay it and kind of get off track as far as he's concerned. And, and we're not judging them. Don't misunderstand. But that's spiritual discernment. If something doesn't feel right or seem right and you can't back it up in God's Word, honey, it ain't right. All right? I mean, it doesn't take a smart person to figure that out. Never follow an individual's words. Follow God's words and you'll never get in trouble. Okay? I can say that's straight from our Father. That's the way He got my attention long ago. And that was my question. And he's, I thought... That's simple enough. Yeah, I can handle that. <laughs> okay, I'm still missing somebody right in here. Was first one with their hand up, and well, I guess I got them already. Yes, the ten virgins, five made it and five failed. What does that mean to us today? It it means their lamps and what they were filled with, because that's what they ran out of, and they were Christians because they made it all the way to midnight which is when the wedding was, practically, almost. Oil, mentioned there, is el Yah. And if anyone's ever studied Hebrew, the name olive oil should really unwind your cord. You know, because you've got both El, God, eh, Yah. And then you know why it's the oil of our people. And it symbolizes... Go for, with me for a moment to Zechariah chapter 4, the seven-stemmed candle with the olive oil reservoirs. How did that oil flow? Without the help of man, but by the Holy Spirit. And I'm not talking down to you. I just want to kind of show you how important, because that oil symbolizes truth. It wasn't olive oil itself they were out of, they hadn't dug into the truth enough, okay? They came up short and probably worshipped 
probably were already with child when, and no longer virgins when the true husband showed up, okay? That's what it means to us. Don't be deceived. Mm -hmm. five, five is grace, okay? And by grace, stick with his word. Those five didn't, okay? Anyone else? Question is, why do sometimes I say that the children of God had a, have a 10-day longer period concerning the two witnesses than Satan does as far as who arrives first? Satan's time, example, in Revelation 13, 4, is given in months, 42 months. And many people say, yeah, that's 1,260 days, sure enough. Well, it's according to whether it's deus, sun, solar, days, or moons, because moons don't make 30 solar days, okay? So the children, however, is always of God are always given in days because we're supposed to use the solar calendar. That's why our Passover is the same year in, year out, and you'll see others fluctuate by sabbatical months in various years. But ours always hangs right there on that solar calendar before, because it's exact. So 260 days, or if we break that back against 42 months, it's 10 days longer. Okay? You lose that much by going by moons, not to mention your soul you lose if you go by Satan's moons. Okay, It's simply the difference in a solar day of months and a lunar day of months, okay? The comment was from Minneapolis where we're on the Great Channel 23, isn't it? Uh, about four or five hours a night, something like that, four hours a night, I guess it is, that she enjoys, you see, about, we didn't tell you, I don't think, but about a month ago, we started tell, taping these lectures on the weekend and playing them on the weekend. And pretty soon, I, I don't know, David maybe could tell us, but you see these light reciprocals up there? They were put up there because we knew probably someday we would be driven to television. But you're going to have some remote things over here and over there, and they're going to be turning around and smiling at you. And they'll, you'll notice they'll follow me as I go, a couple of them, and then they'll have the one back there. So if you see it, if you see one of those turn on you, look holy. <laughs> I jest, you already look holy just like you are, all right? Thank you. I appreciate that. That's kind of like a second witness because I had to cut loose with, we had to cut loose with a pretty good sized piece of chain chain change it wasn't change it was big bucks okay for that kind of equipment but that that's a witness that the technicians and myself needed to say what did you say go for it go for it all right we're going to do it i think you're going to stand we hear you dear in the book of exodus i don't remember the count of shiver in the down sorry but there was one of the towns that they went by, and it said it was the 12 fountains. The 12 fountains, okay. I'm working on it. Go ahead. Was the water sweet or bitter? I don't remember. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, hon. 12 fountains, and, and the reason I didn't have this question organized is because it wasn't until something you said today that that rang a bell to remind right. me of that when I was covering it. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering... Because I was going back and check it out. What does that 12 fountain symbolize? Because they stopped and there was 12 fountains in this town. Oh, help me. That will not come through for me. But it, it's like the 12 manner of leaves, though. And, and of course, the fountain. I'm, I'm going to be teaching on that at Passover. Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? 
It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar. For if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 1.46 Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. The book Traditions of Glastonbury by E. Raymond Cap is our item number six. The suggested donation is $12. Mr. Cap is a biblical archaeologist and historian. This book historically documents the whereabouts of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from his early teens until he was approximately 30 years of age. The Traditions of Glastonbury records facts that prove Jesus and Mary's uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, traveled to the British Isles. The Shepherd's Chapel also makes this documentary available on DVD video. The Traditions of Glastonbury on DVD is our item 46651, and the suggested donation is $25. Whether you order the book or the DV, you will enjoy sharing this fascinating work with family and friends over and over again. Order your copy of Traditions of Glastonbury today. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.